Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm going to welcome you all out tonight, those that are here in the sanctuary and those that are online. As you can see, I'm not Bishop Thomas. <laughs> so, he is traveling this week, so I'm filling in for him tonight, but he will be back um, tomorrow, be back next week for Bible study. So, um, as he does, just want to remind everybody um, to share, like, subscribe to our various social media uh, platforms. So you have access to um, previous Bible studies or service or any other events that we may be recording or streaming live here at Calvary. Um, one thing we also want to do is make sure we keep our sick and shut in um, in prayer. And I know they'll have that on the, the screen to remember them and to cover, keep them covered. You see we have quite a few um, bereavement. Justina Bruington um, Comer, who lost her brother. We have Miriam, um, Reverend Mary and bro brother Rudolph Smith, the passing of their nephew. And we have Jackie Robinson, who's the husband of the late Phyllis Robinson, um, who was a dear member here as well. Um, keep him and his family in prayer. And then also um, Melissa Jeter, the passing of her cousin, um, to keep her in prayer and her family in prayer as, as well. Um, so just like the regular format, we're still going to have question and answer. So if you do have a question on the lesson tonight, feel free to put it in the chat or, you know, communicate it with um, the team and they'll make sure once we finish that we'll address any questions that you um, may have. The other thing that Bishop wants to be aware of, if there's topics, specific topics that you're interested in <clears throat> as he wraps up this um, series he's doing on spiritual war warfare, Please make sure you submit those as well, and then he could take those in consideration as he's planning and strategizing for um, future series for Wednesday night. So make sure that you do that, okay? So let's get in our topic. Um, for the last several months, Bishop has been teaching on spiritual warfare, and when I spoke with him, I told him I'll stay in that vein as well, but I want to talk to it from a different perspective. I want to talk about it from the perspective of unity in the body and how that is critical in being effective and victorious in dealing with spiritual warfare. And so we know the scriptures that he's been using as his foundation scripture is 1 Peter verses five, chapter 5, verses 8, where it says, and I'm reading from the Amplified, it says, Be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times that the, the enemy of yours, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely, hung, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. And then the other scripture that's the base or foundational scripture that Bishop has been using is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, where it says, so that we won't be outwitted by Satan. We are not ignorant of his devices. And so the whole purpose of this teaching, what Bishop has been doing, is so that we're aware of the strategies that the enemy would try to use to take advantage of us. And so Bishop has been really teaching on the subtleties, the little things. You know, sometimes we think of spiritual warfare, we think of the more um, spectacular things that you see, you know, things you see on TV, and it's not just on TV, things that really do, do happen, um, the more dem demonstrative things that we see. But the enemy is very subtle. And so the other thing that Bishop had really been bringing out is that he studies us and he's aware of our weaknesses. He's aware of the areas that we need to grow. And so we need to be um, very aware that he's watching us and to make sure that we follow um, the word and what God would have us to do so that we can withstand um, the attacks of the enemy. And one thing that's really important in this, I wanted to focus on the unity in the body is we're not in this war alone. I know sometimes it may feel like we're by ourselves. It may feel like we're struggling and, and really in some challenging situations by ourselves, but we're, we're not. And that's why it's so important that we understand as a body how we're to function and work together and so that we can um, support one another as we're going through various phases or situations and um, tactics that the enemy would try to throw at us. So one thing that's important for us to remember also that God has provided us the tools that we need in order to withstand the attacks that we face. In Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 13 through 18, it's a familiar scripture to most, is that therefore take up the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand firm. Stand there, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes, shoes for your feet, having the readiness to give the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take the shield of faith, which will, you will be able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And what's important that I want to bring out in that last part, that last verse in verse 18, where it says that we are to keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all saints. And so this is how we cover one another. And so it's, we can't get so caught up in what we're dealing with, what we're struggling with, that we forget that we need to cover our brother and sister. And so God has really given us the tools that we need in order to be victorious in this walk or in this, the, um, the warfare that we may be dealing with. The first thing that he has given us, he's given us his word. You have it on the screen here. Psalms 119 and 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It is the word that gives us, it enlightens the path that we're to walk. It gives us instruction. It helps give us direction which way to go. Another scripture is Psalms 18 and 30. It says, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. His shield, shields are um, he shields all who take refuge in him. So he is giving us the tool of his word. That's the first thing. The second thing that he has given us is his spirit. And so you see in the scriptures that I have here that as those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, his spirit is within us. John 14 and 26 says that, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this was Jesus talking, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit has been provided to us who li and lives within us as believers who's guiding us and reminding us of the things that have already been deposited. And just like Bishop says all the time, if you're not making deposit, the Holy Spirit doesn't have anything to bring to our remembrance. So we want to make sure we're making those deposits by spending time in prayer, spending time in the Word of God. So then when situations do come up, we'll be able to recall it, and the Holy Spirit will help us to recall. And so in the third area that God has provided for us to be victorious is other people. And so Bishop has been talking about how we have professionals and, and you know, the importance of, of um, having access to professionals, whether it's counselors, doctors, or whatever. But also from the vantage point that we're going to look at tonight is other believers. And so the talents, the gifting, the support that we have for, for other believers is part of the toolbox that God has given in addition to his word, to his spirit as well. And so, like I said, as we continue to go on, we're going to focus specifically on the body. Now, back in the probably the 80s, the 90s, there was a word or a phrase that became very popular. It's called body life. And really what that was talking about is how we function together as a unit in the body of Christ. And so um, what I have on the screen here, what is body life? Body life is really how we relate to one another, how we interact with one another, how we support one another, how we encourage one another, how we uplift one another. And so when we think about this, the model of the early church, if you read the early church in, in the formation of the early church in, in the book of Acts, how they had all things in common, how they supported one another, how they covered one another, that model still is relevant even today for us to support one another and to encourage one another. I know oftentimes, especially on Sunday, once we, you know, have service, a lot of times we're rushing out the door, you know, we already have on our mind what we need to do, where we need to go to eat. But it's important for us to be sensitive to those that are around us to support one another and to encourage one another on Sunday. And then we're all dressed and we look like everything's okay and everything is um, we don't have any issues in the world, but there's a lot of issues that are coming in the doors. And so as a body and functioning in body life and as the body of Christ, as we spend time in the word, as we spend time with, in prayer with the Father, he will quicken us to let us know. There might be somebody sitting next to us that just needs 
smile just needs to be acknowledged. Um, you don't know what it took for them to get to church, to get there, and might not have almost couldn't make it, but pushed their way. So it's important for us to be sensitive in those type of situations and moving forward with um, the different situations that we have to deal with. And so for 1 Corinthians, here, see on here, chapter 12, verses 12 through 27, and I'm going to read um, all of it. I want to read the first it says, for just as the body and many members and all parts, though many, form only one body, so it is with Christ. For by one Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, spiritually transformed, a reading from the Amplified, united together, whether Jews or Greeks, Gentiles, slave or free, and we, we were all made to drink of one Holy Spirit since the same Holy Spirit fills each life. For the human body does not consist of one part, but many parts, limbs, and organs. And so if you drop down in verse 20, um, I just read verses 12 through 14, but 26, it says, and if one member suffers, all parts share the suffering. If one member is honored, all rejoice with it. And so that's key to body life. That if one of us is suffering, one of us is struggling, it should be the concern of all of us. It shouldn't be like, you know, looking at someone and say, well, you know, I got mine, my life is good, um, I don't have any issues, I'll pray for you and keep it moving. But how can we really engage, how can we really support one another when we see another person in the body that's suffering and they're struggling? And so supporting one another and sharing in each other's struggle or, or suffering is key to unity in the body of Christ. And one thing that I found that's really um, been helpful and it's really been a blessing that Bishop has instituted recently is, and it seem, may seem like it's a small thing, but it's very impactful. You know, on Sunday morning when he asks if there are any visitors and they raise their hand and then he'll say, um, you know, if people who are around it, ask them. If you're sitting by somebody you don't know, or you don't know their name, ask them their name. Something that small is so impactful, and I'll tell you why. It makes a person feel welcome. It makes them feel welcome. It makes a person feel seen. Yes. And then it also makes them feel included. And so when you think about it, I had experience <clears throat> years ago when I lived in Oklahoma. I, went to, I was in Bible school there. And growing up here, Calvary was much smaller. I mean, we were what, almost 700 members now. But it was much smaller, so everybody knew everyone. You know, you didn't have to, you know, even visitors, because we knew each other in the community. And so I attended for the first time in my life a church that on Sunday morning there was 5,000 people in the room. And so I would go in there. Now, I'm, I moved to Tulsa. I was 1,500 miles away from home, so I don't know anybody, don't have any family, don't have any friends around. Um, and so I would go to church, and I would sit there in service, and no one would say anything, anyone to me, nothing. I would get up and go. Now, I could have said something, too, but I was visiting this church. So my expectation was, you know, that someone would recognize that I was a visitor. Sunday after Sunday, I would go. No one said anything. So it got to a point where it began to really impact me because I never experienced that before. I grew up in a church where I knew everybody, everyone knew me. And so what it did, it made me feel like I wasn't welcome there. It made me feel that I wasn't seen there, and it made me feel like I wasn't included. And what I found as a result of that, I was there going to Bible school, but it was very easy for me to miss a Sunday because I figured no one knows I'm not there anyway. And so that's why it's so important for us to acknowledge people. Like I said, something that seems that small, insignificant, you don't know how it's impacting somebody, else. And so um, on Sunday, one of the things that I like to do, I'm, I'm usually sitting right over there. As soon as Bishop says, you know, for welcome, you know, if there's any new, new people, I turn my body and I scan the room. Because what I want to be able to do is not rush out on Sunday, but get to those people who are visiting us there for the first time. It's easy for us to usually, you know, collect with those that we know, those that we're used to spending time with. But making a, a, a an intentional effort 
to go to someone who's come in here that's a visitor. It'll make a, a tremendous difference from experience. And just people who, when the, one of the things they'll say, why did you join that church? Because you made me feel included. You know, preaching's good, music's good, but I felt like they wanted me there. And so we want to make sure no one leaves here feeling that they're not wanted or they weren't, they weren't seen. And so when we think about this whole concept of body life, and so why is it important in dealing with spiritual warfare? Because what impacts one impacts all. Even if it feels like you may not be impacted, we're all impacted because we're jointly fit together, the word says so. If I'm going through something and it causes me to be out of place, you're going to miss out on something because what I provide, you need. What you provide, I need. It may not be visible that we can see that that difference is being made, but there is definitely an impact on that. And so the enemy wants this concept or this unity not to exist in the body of Christ. He understands the importance and the impact and the power of unity. We look at these scriptures in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 10, 9, and 10. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. And another scripture that we have on here is Deuteronomy 32 and 30. It says, how should one, how should one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight except their rock has sold them and the Lord has shut them up. In unity, when we look at that, you would think, okay, one would put 10,000, put 1,000 to flight, two should put 2,000 to flight. But in unity, it is not additive, it multiplies impact. It multiplies the impact. And so when we think about being unified, think about the things that we could accomplish, the things that we can overcome the tactics of the enemy, the things that the enemy would try to stop even this local ministry from doing if we were unified um, in coming against that, that thing that the enemy would try to stop. And so the enemy is very cunning, very strategic in his tactics of how he wants to cause this unity in the body to break down in order for his agenda to go forward. And so we think about one of the main tactics, and Bishop talked a little bit about this, that the enemy uses is isolation. Isolation. And so under isolation, I have several words. The first one I have is shame. If the enemy can get you to feel shame, shame is, the definition is a painful emotion that is caused by consciousness of guilt failure, impropriety that often results in a paralyzing convictions belief that one is worthless or of no value to others or to God, unacceptable, altogether deserving of disdain or rejection. If the enemy can plant that seed of shame in our minds, what it does, it causes us to run away from God, not to God. Shame is different from godly sorrow and repentance. We think of godly sorrow. Godly sorrow causes us to move toward repentance. Shame will want us to turn away from God because it begins to think that God can't forgive this. I know he forgives a lot, but he's not going to forgive this, especially if it's something we knew better and we did it anyway. And so as he uses shame to, as an isolation tactic, one of the things also we really dealt with, we saw this in 2020 with the whole pandemic and the shutdown. Um, isolation was an extreme problem for a lot of people, especially those that live by themselves, and even some that live with people. That is not the most pleasant situation that they live in. They're now shut in this house with someone they don't have. We couldn't come to church during that time. Every, the only thing we could do was watch online. So the enemy was playing with a lot of people's mind, and the, the issue and the challenge that some still have, the residue of that still exists for some. And so that's why it's so important as the body that we're supporting one another. And so let's look at the second one. The second one is insecurity. And I know Bishop touched on this as well. Security definition is a lack of confidence, assurance, and self-doubt or feeling, of, or feeling safe. 
Insecurity presents itself through fear, worry, worry, doubt, apprehension, and uncertainty. And what happens is when people are dealing with insecurity, the way they may hide it or deflect it is through um, lashing out, pushing people away. And so if they push people away, then you can't see what the real issue is around them. So rather than being vulnerable with one another, with those insecurities will push people away. And when we push people away, that gives the, the enemy the opportunity to isolate us away from everybody else. Another one, embarrassment. Embarrassment, definition of embarrassment, can, it can be personal and can be caused by unwanted attention to private matters or personal flaws or mishaps or shyness. When we're embarrassed by a situation, it may not even be anything that we have done. It could be something that a family member done, but we know other people know about it. And because we know other people know about it, we're embarrassed by it and we're concerned about how people are going to look at me, how people are viewing me because of this. And what it may cause us to do is to move away from the body, to move away from church, to isolate ourselves. Another one that, that I was, as I was studying, self-sufficiency. We said, I can handle this by myself. And it reminded me, you know, of the cartoon where there's a hole in the wall and water's coming in. And in the cartoon, they put the finger in one hole, thinking they got it under control. And then there's another hole that caught another crack. So they stick another finger in there trying. And before they know it, they have all their finger, their toes, everything. And while they're trying to maintain this, this wall is busy cracking and falling down. And so sometimes we think we can handle this by ourselves. I don't need anybody to be involved. I don't want anyone to know. I'm private. And so what it does, the enemy will just cause it to spiral even worse and worse and worse. And then the last one I have on there, offense. Offense is a major area that we have to deal with and be mindful of. And offense is about arousing resentment or anger. And so we all have an expectation of, of how we want to be treated, or what we expect from other people. And when they do something contrary to that, we can become offended. And because we become offended, we don't want to deal with that person. And then we may start making generalizations that everybody's like that. You can't trust anybody, because everybody will treat you that way. And so the enemy will use offense as well. And the longer we stay offended, and the longer we pull away from, from people, we start coming up with other things in our mind. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've been offended or someone did something to you, and then you start thinking, well, they probably always wanted to do that. You know, oh, they, when they said this, that was probably an issue too. So we start adding to it and, and magnifying the offense. And so I remember years ago, I can't remember how many years ago, Reverend Connie Phillips had preached a sermon called Wounded by Friendly Fire. Usually, if we have someone that we don't really know and they do something, we might not be too offended. But when it happens to somebody who's close to us and we don't expect them to come against us, we don't expect them to talk about us, we don't expect, we expect them to be there for us and they're not, it really can cause such a hurt, such a pain in us that well, the enemy can use that crack because of, of that offense to further isolate us. And so when we think about how do we effectively or how can we effectively operate in the body, in body life to combat, to combat spiritual warfare, what God has given us is unity as the tool, as the foundation. But there's three things that are important in order to establish that foundation. The first is the love of God. That has to be key in establishing this foundation of unity. Regardless of our differences or regardless of our background, one thing that we have to have in common and we do have in common is our love for God, or we should have in common, our love for God. The second thing that we should have is the love of God's agenda and purpose. It's not about our agenda. It's not about us. We hear people say that all the time, but do we really believe that? So the first is the love of God, having that in common the love of God's agenda and purpose. God, what do you want to accomplish? What do you have on your mind? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is it that you have placed me in this position, in this location to do to accomplish your will? And the third thing we look at is the love 
of God's people. So when we have those three things operating in our life, it lays the foundation for each one of us individually in order to operate collectively in, in this unified body. And so we know that in Mark it tells us very clear that commandment in Mark 12 and 30 through 31, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The whole point or the whole basis of us being able to be a unified force as God created the body to be with Jesus being ahead are these three specific principles. Our actions should be governed through the love, our love for God. Our actions should be governed by the love of God's agenda and what he wants to accomplish and our love for people. And that last one, when we have a love for people, it causes us to want to see the best in people to give them the benefit of the doubt until they keep, we start seeing a pattern that we can't, you know, the benefit of the doubt no longer exists. <laughs> but we want to make sure that when we look and operate as a body, as a whole, that we have these three principles in um, working together. When we look at the example in Acts, and this is one of my favorite scriptures in this prayer in Acts chapter 4, what was going on is Peter and John, they, had, they were preaching, you know, in the, the temples and in the areas, and the religious people said, we don't want you preaching Jesus anymore. And they actually threatened them um, that if they didn't stop, they were gonna bring harm to them. And so when we look at, we pick up in verse 23, after it says, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders said to them, this threatening they reported to their friends. Verse 24 is key, it says, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. So when they came back to their friends, they came back to their um, company, the, those that were part of the church, they shared the threats that they had. People didn't say, well, we better stop preaching, or we better stop doing this. They listened to what Peter and John said, and they lifted their voice to God in prayer, united prayer. And if you read this prayer, going from 24, and I won't read the whole thing, all the way down to 27, what they did, they did not focus on the attacks they were dealing with. What they did, they rehearsed who God had been, how God had already demonstrated himself to be faithful, to be reliable through the history. And so then it wasn't until after they prayed that about how sovereign God is, his, him being in control, and how the enemy would, had tried to stop him or stop the word from going forward and still went. And in verse 29, it says, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. So what they did was they focused on who God was. And it wasn't until after they got to the end of this prayer, that they said, now give us the boldness to keep carrying out your agenda. Point number two. Their love for God's agenda, God's purpose, was more important to them than the threats and their life. And so then it goes on in verse 30, it says, while stretch your, out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed in the place which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. We see the power of unity in this prayer that when they listen to what Peter and John came back and told them about the threats, their first reaction was to go to the Father in prayer. It's like, we're, going to stand, we're still going to stand on what God has told us to do. And when they said, God, give us the boldness, the fact that they asked that in verse 29, um, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your service to continue to speak your word with boldness, evidently their boldness had waned. So they were asking God, give us the boldness to continue to do what you have called us to do. And it says, and when they did that, and they finished that prayer, the place was shaken, and they were all filled. Now, they had been filled before, because remember Acts um, chapter 1, but it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit, refilled, and they continued to do what God had called them to do. So they didn't allow the threats and the tactics and the, um, of the enemy to stop them from doing what God had called them to do. And the other thing that's really important in the scripture to understand, it's not about the number of people praying. It's the unity in prayer. Doesn't take a lot of people. 
Sometimes we think we have a big crowd praying, that's effective prayer. That doesn't make prayer effective. Unity, focus, one accord is what makes prayer effective, and the same thing for, for us. And so here, when it talks about in the scripture how they lifted up their voice, I'm sure they all were praying, but it wasn't just their voice that was lifted up. Their hearts were lifted to God. And it's the same thing that we must do as a body. When we come against challenges as a corporate body, or even if um, one of the members has an issue that's going on, to lift up our hearts as if the issue was our own. As if the issue, because it is our own, because we're one body. And so, and be willing to pray the same way you would want somebody praying for you if that was your issue. Amen. Yeah. Amen. If it's our issue, we want everybody to lay out on the floor, wallow, scream, and holler. Mm -hmm. So with the same intensity or the same commitment, the same dedication that we would want people praying for us, we need to cover one another. That's what God expects from us. And so when we think about this, there's a scripture how we stand that in verse, in chapter, in, I'm sorry, in Acts 4, it was dealing more of a corporate setting. But here, sometimes when we're dealing with one-on-one -on -one or a, a smaller setting, that prayer of agreement is still important to stand with one another in the situation that we're dealing with. And so in the Amplified Version of Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 and 20, it says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whatever you bind, forbid, declare to be improper or unlawful on earth shall have already been bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose, permit, declare lawful on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two believers on earth agree, that is, are of one mind in harmony, about anything that they ask within the will of God, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in the name, meeting together as the Father, I am among them. And so sometimes we would use that scripture as an excuse when people don't show up for a service. Well, you know, just two or three gathered in my name, there I'm in the midst. That's not what that's talking about. We can have two or three gathered and nothing's still happening. Because my mind is one place, your mind is somewhere else. But it's about the unity. And so when we look at that scripture, several things it tells us in standing in agreement. And that's important that we learn how to stand in agreement with one another. First, it tells us that we have to ask. We're standing and believing God for something. We need to ask. It says about anything um, in verse 19, it says, two or three, um, two, if two believers on earth agree about anything that they ask. So we have to make a petition, a petition to God. And so we can't just say, I'm just going to stay in agreement with you, and we have to ask anything. It's making that request. And then it talks about the agreement that you stand in. And so several components to this agreement. One thing we have to be very careful is that we don't fake agreement. You know, someone say, agree with me, sure, I'm agreeing with you. You walk away, you can't even tell them what you agreed with. And so we want to be very intentional when we're standing in agreement with someone. So the first thing, we must agree we have the right to ask through the brother of Jesus and because of the covenant we have with the Father. Understand you have a right to ask. You need to be clear and confident that we have that right to ask. Now, if someone's asking you to stay in agreement with something and you know you just can't be in agreement with that, don't fake it. Don't stay in agreement with it. Because the thing about it is if you start saying that you're agreeing with every time someone asks you, and you just want to be polite and you don't have in your spirit, you're getting a check, no, no, I'm not supposed to stay in agreement for this. It's impacting your faith. It'll impact your faith. So be honest, make sure it's something from your heart that you could stand in agreement. The second thing, agreement has to be based on the, requ the request, request has to be scriptural and substantial, substantiated by the word of God. So we can't just come up with these ideas. Where in the scripture do we have as our foundation that we can stand and agree on this situation or circumstance that we're dealing with? So the prayer of agreement is not something that we pray, pray quickly. We have to do some work. 
What is the, what is the, the scripture that we're going to hold on to as we're going through this situation? Because prayer agreement, wait, and we'll talk about this a little, a little later, before we see the manifestation of what we're standing in agreement with, it may be, be a while. So what is going to anchor you in, in this prayer with someone as far as like being in agreement with them? The, other thing, the next thing is agree that what I'm praying is the will of God. You got to know what the scripture says, and this is God's will. Not, not my want, it's his will and being able to stand on that. And then the fourth thing we have here is uh, agree that my request will be granted of the Father. Both people, both parties, those that are involved in this agreement must understand that. So let me tell you the first one again. First you have to agree that you have a right to ask. Have confidence that you have a right to go to the Father on this situation. The second thing that your agreement has to be based on Scripture. Can't be just some pie in the sky. What does the say so that we can anchor ourselves on that. Know that it is the will of God. How do we know if it's the will of God? What does his word say? And the fourth thing is agree that God will grant that which we ask. It may take a while before it's manifestation, manifested, but still agree, regardless of how long it takes, I'm standing on his word. I know this is the will of the Father, and I know he's going to bring it to pass. And so when we think about the scripture in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 16, sometimes we have to, it takes us a while to get to this point. But in this verse in the Amplified, it says, and this is the remarkable degree of confidence which we as believers are entitled to and have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will that is consistent with his plan and purpose, he hears us. And if we know for a fact, as indeed we do, that he hears and listens to us in whatever way we ask, we also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted to us the request which we have asked from him. The first thing we got to be very clear is that he hears you. Sometimes people don't believe God really hears them. So they feel that they have to get somebody else to pray because God will hear your prayer before he hears my prayer. God will hear your prayer just like he hears my prayer. You're a child of the Most High God. He's looking attentive to your voice, wants to hear your voice. Nothing wrong with having other people pray for you, but he wants to hear from you. <clears throat> and so understanding and having this confidence, sometimes it takes time to, with the spending time in the word, to build our confidence that he hears us, that we have a right to ask, that we have a right to go before him on our own through Jesus Christ. We have that, that right. And so when we think about when we're standing with someone, um, and standing in agreement with, with someone, it's not about if I'm standing with you or, you or you're standing with me and I have an issue and I say, I want you to stay in agreement with me on this and this is the word I'm standing and believing God for, it's not up to the person who's being requested to stand for them to say, well, I know you believe in God for God down here. Let's believe for him for something up here. No, you meet the person where they are. It's not about demonstrating how spiritual we are, but how faithful God is. So if someone comes to say, you know, I, I'm really struggling in this area and I, wanna, I need you to stand with me. Okay, what, what do we want to believe God for? What, what is it that we want to believe God for? What scripture do you want to stand on? Okay, I can join in with you based on that scripture. And so we don't want to make people feel small about what they believe. Well, that's all you're going to believe God for? Why are you bothering him with that? We don't want to make people feel small about it. But meet people where they are and support them where they are. The other thing about this, it's not about screaming and hollering how long you pray, but it's effective prayer. It's what the Word said. Bishop talked about this last week, praying the Word. The Scripture tells us that when his Word goes out, it will not return unto him void, but it will prosper where he sent it. It's not the volume, it's the Word. It's not the volume, it's the Word. Is not how long, but the effectiveness of God's word. And so when we look at this, one of the things that, that, um, that I learned long ago is we're standing with someone, and Bishop talked about this as well um, last week, how when you're hit with things, and we're dealing with the spiritual warfare, and it seems like things are coming at you, coming at you, sometimes we'll start shrinking back. It feels like things are just coming at us so strong that 
I can't, can't stand. That's why the prayer of agreement, being in agreement, and having the body sustain and working together is so key and so important. And so I saw this diagram. I don't know if anyone knows what wheel chalking is. If you drive a truck, you know what that is. It's also called blocking. And so what they do is when they park that truck, they put these chalks or these blocks behind the wheel to keep the wheel from rolling back. So as believers, when we're standing in agreement with someone, we're chalking them. We're helping them to stand so that when they're coming under continuous attack and they begin to shrink back from the word that they're trying to stand on, say, no, I got you. I got you. Remember we believe this? Remember we're standing on this? God's word hasn't changed. We're still standing. Still standing. That's prayer of agreement. That takes time. That's an investment of time. And so as believers, and in this body life, and in standing in unity with one another, when we pray with someone and we say amen, that's not the end, that's the beginning. The amen seals what we're standing for. Now it's time to stand and walk it out. And so sometimes we, that's why I said we need to be very mindful when, we're, when someone asks us to pray with them and agree with them to really invest the time with someone to say, what are we standing for? What is the word we, we're holding on to? And so if it takes a day, if it takes weeks, if it takes months, if it takes years, are you still going to chalk them? Or are you going to get tired or frustrated? Because when the phone rings and we see the phone ring again and we got that caller ID and we're looking, oh, no, here they come again. <laughs> We've all done it. We've all done it. <laughs> but when, you're, when you make the decision that you're going to stand with someone, that you're going to, like this, this diagram, you're going to chalk with them, you have to make the decision. You're going to be in it for the long haul. That's body life. That's body life. That means sometimes you might get a call in the middle of the night. That person's struggling. I'm trying to stand, but I'm struggling. But you made the decision to go into agreement with them. Made the decision. So when we do that, the same way that someone is, needs someone to stand with them with that regard, we want to have someone who's willing to go in with us that way. So you think about it, what if all of us as believers, working together as one body, stand together with one another when someone is in trouble and shrinking back? We said, no, I got you. Remember, we said, this is the scripture we're standing on. Remember when we prayed this? I'm still believing God for you. And even if I have to carry you through this for a little bit, I'm willing to do that. I made a decision to stand in agreement with you. And so when we think of, even going back to when we were talking about um, isolation, I like watching, I don't like being outside, but I like watching nature shows on TV. <laughs> National Geographic, I could watch that all day. Wicked Tuna, love those shows. One of the things, and I, it's like the tactic of the enemy as well, what happens is, on those shows, you see a herd of animals, right? And so when the prey is trying to get to them, and they see that prey, whether it's lion or whatever, hyena, they all start running. But what the predator wants to do is cause that prey, somebody to run off to the right where everybody is running to the left. That's the same thing the enemy will try to do us in separating us. And so once that predator is able to separate them from the pack, then they can get them. But the other thing that I think is real key when I watch these shows is you try to do that to an elephant. <laughs> they go after that baby, all of a sudden you see all these elephants come and circle. Yes. And so not only circle the baby elephant, but they circle the mother because the mother's still vulnerable because she just had the baby. And what they do, they come around, and all, after a while, you can't even see the mother, you can't even see the baby, because the other elephants surround them and engulf them to protect them. Are we willing to do that as fellow believers? 
or do we have the attitude where you got yourself out there? <laughs> Swim. <laughs> Make it work for you. But be willing to surround each other to protect one another at all costs. Because we would want someone doing that for us. And so looking at the unity of the body and looking at how we work together, it's not, it goes beyond just coming to church on Sunday. It goes beyond that. It's a lifestyle, life commitment that we make to one another. And we can make the decision whether we want to make that decision, make that um, you know, commitment to one another. And so when we think about um, I remember I was in a, had a situation I was dealing with. My mother was standing with me in agreement for, for something. And things kept coming and things kept coming and things kept coming at me. And I was like, I, don't, I can't, you know, and I, I wanted to say something about it. And I know the Lord said, don't touch it with your mouth. Don't say nothing. But I got to the point, I, I don't know if I can hold it anymore. I need to say something. And so I was telling my mother, I said, I said, I need to address this. She said, what did the Lord tell you? I said, he told me to leave it alone, don't say nothing. She said, why do you feel you need to say, I said, I need to say something. I just need to say something. And she said, you need to ask the Lord to guard your mouth and set a guard over your lips. And I said, well, what scripture is that? And so if you know my mother, whenever I, you know, say something like that, the first thing is, gal, get your Bible. So I got the Bible. She, she took me to the scripture, Psalms 141. This may be a blessing to you, somebody else. Psalms 141 and 3, it says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch, keep watch over the door of my lips to keep me from speaking thoughtlessly. And so what I had to do was take that scripture and I put it as my, um, on my phone, my screensaver, on my phone, on my computer to remind me and to stand on that. God, keep a watch, set a guard over my mouth. Watch over the door of my lips so I don't speak thoughtlessly out of turn, and he did it. He did it. And so when you think about the scriptures that you use, make sure it's something that you can put into play with you and that person that you're standing with. And remember it. If you have to write it down, put it on a card, put it on a post-it, stick it on your mirror, whatever you have to do to keep that word in front of you, it is key and it's really important. And so just wrapping up and understanding this, the body is important. We're all needed. How are we going to win in this warfare that we have to deal with while we're here on earth? Yes, we got the word of God, and the word is key. Yes, we have his spirit. His spirit is key. But the other thing that's really important for us to know is God has brought the body together so that we can support one another be there for one another so we don't have to live in isolation. You don't have to live alone in isolation, away, figuring out how to deal with this by yourself. And the thing I want you to remind you also, remember this, that we all have to stand in agreement with somebody, but be intentional about it. Be very intentional. Don't be flippant in saying, well, I'll, you know, someone say, well, stay in agreement with me. Okay, I'm agreed with you, and you all walk your separate ways. You don't even know what you're agreeing to. Take the time, invest the time with the person to find out what are we standing on? What do we believe in God for? What is it that you want to believe God for that I can join my faith with you and then stick with them until a manifestation comes? Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to close. Any questions? Check to see if there's any questions that are coming. Any questions? Well, I think you did an excellent job bringing it together. Yeah. Yeah. This is a better war challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Dole. Yeah. This yeah. Have nothing to worry Especially about. with that chalk <laughs> and supporting someone. Mm -hmm. And then you brought it all together. You know, where you talked about the animals, how they herd around, and it just brought that scripture together, mm -hmm. the body of Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. And if everything is working properly, mm -hmm. you know, spending that time with God, then we're able to discern the spirit of what people are dealing with. Everybody's covered. That's right. 
because the spirit is going to take care of everything that's within the house, but we just have to be obedient to do what God has called us to do. Absolutely. You did an excellent right. job in Absolutely. bringing that together. I really appreciate Praise that. God. Praise and we have a question is, sure. um, how do you make the distinction between supporting someone and enabling someone to remain in a weak state? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. When you think about supporting versus enabling, it's like, what, what are you standing? It goes back to the word that you're standing on. Right. And so that's why I started off um, when I said, what are you standing in agreement with? It's not for you to carry the weight for them. You're supporting them. Right. right. And so oftentimes I've had where someone, they would say, well, can you pray for me? Can you pray for me? I said, no, you pray. He wants to hear your voice. Amen. Mm -hmm. You pray. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And so for a while, you may have to carry someone, but understand and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit when it's time to say, okay, you know, this is where, you know, you need other support. Mm -hmm. Or I can't replace the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm not replaced. I'm not God in your life. Right. To make sure that their dependence is on the Father and not on you. Yes. You're simply a support, but you're not their God. You're not their Savior. Mm -hmm. So I hope that That's answers good. the question. Yes. Any other questions? I don't have any other questions. Well, let questions. me just add to this. Okay. You, you've spoken about that Holy Spirit mm -hmm. a number of times and how the unity in the body helps us with that spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us your thoughts a little bit more about how the Holy Spirit can help us in our body life deal with that spiritual warfare? Well, if I understand your question right, how, how the Holy Spirit helps us to interact. Exactly. Um, well, the three points that I brought out where, you know, the love of God's word, mm -hmm. his, you know, the love of God's agenda and his purpose, and then the love of God's people. So when we look at in our individual lives, if I, like I said, understand your question right, is where are we in our word life? Where are we as far as understanding what God's agenda, God's purpose is, and then understanding that it takes all of us working together yes. in order to accomplish that, um, that purpose and that agenda. I'm not sure if that's answering no, question. No, that is you answer it because up. some of the parts of that, as you were saying, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes in our uh, our spiritual life, we are wounded by friendly fire. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. We are wounded by people sitting next to us mm -hmm. in the pews. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think what you were saying, you know, we the foundation of it is love. It is. You know, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so often you say, uh, "How can you love God and you don't even talk to your brother sitting next right. to you?" Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And then the, the scripture also, you know, in the gospel, it makes it very clear if, you know, if you've offended a brother or a brother's offended, you, you go to them yes. exactly. rather than let it fester. Because yes. sometimes we'll let it fester. And then, then we want to bring, tell the story to other people how someone offended us. And then what happens is I'm not even involved in it, mm -hmm. you know, but because you're offended, I'm upset you're offended. Exactly. So now I'm offended at the person too. And I right. was never Don't involved in the situation <laughs> yes. at all. So we take the offense of other people because it's our friend or because it's our, our loved one. But what we should be encouraging, what do you have to do to go to that person to get this straight? Right. Rather than let it keep going on and get worse and worse and, and, and prolong the situation. You gave us so much, I think, during this session that I was taking notes. I don't know if we had any more questions coming, Elder Borden. No, we don't have any more questions, well, but I just want to say is. that Reverend Dawson, you did an excellent job, well, and I and that. I thank thank you, Deacon Horton, for being with us tonight. Oh, well, it's a pleasure, always. Thank yes, you. always. Thank you. Uh, one other thing that sure. I just well, I think we have a little more time, but uh, you were saying something mm -hmm. about uh, chalky. Mm -hmm. I love chalky, and right. the first thing came to my mind was addiction sponsorship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same with prayer. Addiction sponsorship, you don't take it lightly. You always have to be there for That's that right. person who you're sponsoring. If they call you at 3 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's the same as chalking. you got to get up and chalk with them. Right. you got to right. get up and right. pray with them early mm -hmm. in the morning if that's what's the case. And I'm thinking that's what you're saying. Absolutely, absolutely. Being willing to stick. And that's why you, know, you can't you know, have a whole bunch of people you're in agreement with, right. and then you don't even remember why you stand in agreement <laughs> with them, what you stand in with them. And so, right. so, you know, make sure it's someone that you're willing to yes. go the long haul with them. Right. But even in going the long haul, I think it goes back to what you were saying, Elder Boyd, make sure in that you're pointing them to Christ and you're not pointing yes. to yourself. Yes. Because you don't want to develop that dependency on you, right. but to point them to Christ. Yes. And to make sure their yes. relationship as a result of this agreement um, their relationship with the Lord is being strengthened. 
Right. You're just there to undergird. That's it. And that you be you stay focused to yes. where you don't become frustrated. Yes. Because yes. sometimes that can happen too. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then it goes back to understanding: Can you stand with this person? Yes. And be honest about that. Right. Know your limits. If, yeah. Know your limits. If you don't feel that you can stand with this person, then don't do that. You could pray. You could pray. You know, prayer of intercession for them. Mm -hmm. But as far as prayer of agreement and going the long haul with them, you may not be able to do that. Be right. honest with yourself in that situation. Or they might need a higher level of care. That's like true. Bishop, Bishop talked about right, that. Right, yeah. right. Know, knowing when they're, yeah. You, right. You could quote the scripture and all that. You could pray with them, but there may be additional yes. assistance, like the, Bishop has been talking about, yes. that's needed in the situation. And so yes. you don't try to replace that and get in over your head. Yes. Yeah. So that's why it's so important to have the Holy Spirit, because he's going to direct you right. when it says, okay, this is as far as I want you to go with mm -hmm. this. Doesn't mean that you're not still believing with them. But but you may have to back up. You're still believing mm -hmm. with them. You're still supporting them, but you may have to back up so they can have additional assistance if it's necessary. I hear you right. say back up, and I hear get out the way. <laughs> get out the way. Let them have their direct mm -hmm. communication with God. Yeah. Get out the way and, and, and pray really that important. they can. Yes, Very important. I agree. Mm -hmm. I have one more question. Sure. Mm -hmm. What is the best defense against spiritual warfare? The word of God. Yes. Amen. And his spirit. Yes. That's the best defense. Yes. And then God also has supplemental things that you can add to it, but your best defense is his word. Yes. His word that covers us and keeps us. Just like the scripture I read in Ephesians chapter 6, where it talks about the whole armor, armor of God. God. You know, that's what covers us. That's what allows us to stand. You know, we can... Not all the flowery words that we're able to say, right. you know, and we can shout, like Bishop says, right. we can shout, but the issue's still going to be there. Right. The word is what changes mm -hmm. things. It's the word that makes the difference. Fall down on the floor and get up and the problem's still there. Still there. Mm -hmm. It's still yeah, there. But, you don't need but the thing about it is the problem may still be there, but if you have the word, your perspective of the problem right. will change. Right. You doesn't still have hope. That, yes. Yeah, you have hope. Doesn't mean that the problem goes away, but mm -hmm. your perspective mm -hmm of the problem will shift when we depend yes. on the word, allow the word to enter our hearts and we stand on the word of God. Okay. And I have another know. question here. Sure. Speaking of choking, I mean chalking, how can, you, how can we share the responsibility of standing with each other and not become burnt out? That's why I said also you can't just spread yourself thin. Right. Every time someone comes and asks you to stand in agreement, it may not be for you to do that. Right. So that's why it's also it's important to listen to the Holy Spirit. Right. To let him direct you. Doesn't mean you can't pray for them. But standing in agreement and chalking the, the demonstration I gave is a totally different right. thing. And so we want, sometimes we want to be so helpful to people that, you know, and, and before we know it, we've burnt out. We need somebody standing and chalking us. Right, I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> we got All right, I, I'm out. sitting here listening to you and I'm song. He's got the mm -hmm. whole world on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. He didn't say we. Right. right. We right. can't carry it all. We yeah. can't carry as many people as God can. Exactly. So, and so yeah. that's why it's so important to listen to the Holy Spirit, right. even in entering agreement with, with people, to know who it is that he would have you to stand, stand with in that, that degree. Yeah, because everybody's not your responsibility. It is not. You can't, can't take and on everybody. you have everybody. to learn how to say no sometimes. That's right. That's right. And yes. even in standing with someone, you need to know how to cast the cares on the Lord. Yes. It's not your burden. Mm -hmm. You're supporting, but it's not your burden. It's still the Lord's who's handling that. I like how you said that you, you can't take care of everybody. You can't and take sometimes, care of everybody. you know, when you're young in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. you want to help everybody yeah. and then you get burnt out and then you feel as though nobody's there mm -hmm. and people will say well I'm hurt you that's know? right but the thing is you have to think about what it is that you did you spread yourself too thin absolutely yes. but if all of us in the body are functioning the way we're supposed to Correct. it won't be a heavy lift for one right. any one person that's right Mm -hmm. It won't be a heavy lift for any. If we're all doing what God has called us to do, if we're all listening to the Holy Spirit, and when He's directing, I want you to, to undergird this person, I want you to support this person, um, then it won't be such a burden right. on, on any one person. That's body life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other that's, questions? That's it. No, I don't have any more questions. All right. All right, Great job, wonderful. Dr. Lawson. Great job. Well, we'll, like I said, next week, Bishop will be back. So we'll close in prayer. Thank everyone for coming out tonight.
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, as the true and final authority for every situation, circumstance that we come up against. We thank you, Lord God, that you've equipped us to be victorious, Lord God, even against the wiles of the enemy, Lord God. We know that you are a sustainer, you are a keeper, you are a shield and our buckler. So, Father, our confidence is in you and your word and your spirit that you made available to us. Father, even as we function together as a united body in Christ, Lord God, help us to understand our place. Help us to understand your direction and, and how to use the gifts that, that you've given to us to be listened to your voice, Lord God, in, in giving those directions of who we're to support, who we're to stand with, Lord God, and how we're to stand with them, understanding that as we stand with them, we're pointing them to you. So, Father, we thank you for this. Father, even as we leave this place, those that are here in the sanctuary, that you would uh, protect them over the highways, that they would go home and find all things well. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.